I mean, clearly, SVB created the problem. The, the reason why it was so extreme is because money is no longer a physical, if you will, piece of paper or a physical mineral. Money is a, you know, an electronic signal which sits on a database. And therefore, if it was, we'll say, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and people wanted to take their money out of Silicon Valley Bank, they would have had to get in their car, drive to the bank, knock on the door, ask the manager, you know, for the money. And the manager would say, well, you know, we'll have it for you in a couple of days. You would go home very unhappy because you didn't get your money, but you probably wouldn't go back in a couple of days because you figured that the San Francisco Fed gave the money to Silicon Valley, so it was there. This time, since, you know, money was an electronic signal, all you had to do was pick up your cell phone. Or, you know, if you're a large corporation, you could take $2 billion out in literally seconds. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to a very special episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Ira Wolf, and thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important, crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and convergence of business, technology, and people. Today, we are lucky enough again to have our friends from Odeon Capital Conversations with us for an update on the economy, finances, jobs, and a whole lot more. We titled today's show, Navigating Never Normal, and never normal it is. Since we last spoke, we had the Silicon Valley co bank collapse, higher interest rates, thousands of layoffs, and yet we still have reported low unemployment, no official recession, the best stock market first quarter since 2000, a 65% increase in the value of Bitcoin, the indictment of a former president, more than 125 mass shootings, a record number of severe weather events, including a tornado, not an earthquake in Los Angeles, more than, and it's all quite fitting for never normal. And, oh, by the way, we had the absolute breakdown of the March Madness brackets, if that's not enough. So my number one forecast for 2023 was never normal is the new normal. And so far, I'm feeling pretty wise. But to test that theory and to help us make sense of Wall Street, Main Street, and the economy, we're very pleased to welcome back our friends from Odeon Capital. First of all, we've got Dick Beauvais. He's been a familiar face for those who watch many of the top business shows and now to our Googleization Nation audience. We are so fortunate to have Dick back, who is the chief financial strategist at Odeon Capital Group and a highly sought after thought leader for investors, the media, and even the White House. Joining Dick once again is Matt Van Alstein, co-founder and managing partner of Odeon Capital Group, a leading Wall Street executive. Matt and Dick team up each week on their podcast, Odeon Capital Conversations, known for their well-informed outlook and views. It is now one of the top ranked Apple podcasts in the business news category in the US Canada, Europe, and Asia. And of course, last but not least, we've got our host and moderator of Odeon Capital Conversations, our good friend, John Aiden Byrne. John teams up each week with Dick and Matt to host and moderate Odeon Capital Conversations, which they talk about all things money and markets. Uh, it's a must listen for investors and any consumers interested in what's going on in our financial markets and current affairs. And then I have the pleasure of joining John each week on, on his top rated Dig Life Deep podcast, which is one of it's in the top one and a half percent of podcasts globally. And we talk each week about Future Shock 2.0. So make sure you go up and listen to Dig Life Deep as well. We're going to come back to John in a few moments because he recently had a fascinating interview with Mark Seal, CEO of Sorsium. He talked about how artificial intelligence, which is in the news every single day, how it's making the, our today's world of work barely recognizable with the fastest pace of change in, in world history. 
Mark grew up in Long Island and is a co-founder, as I said, of Consortium, which is a Web3 metaverse technology provider. And he has a, a fascinating story because Mark's working out of El Salvador. Now, we'll be talking a little bit more about AI and Mark and John will give us some insights there. But gentlemen, welcome back to Geek Skeezers Googleization. Thank you, Dick, Matt, and John for joining us again. I'm going to start with you, Dick. You recently had three, there were three special episodes on Odeon Capital conversations that were related to the SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank crisis. There, it, by the way, it was one of the most downloaded episodes in, in, in your podcast history. But on episode 60, you talked about how bank depositors may not be the only group of people asking questions about the bank. You said bank investors are questioning the earnings numbers, which will be coming out shortly, the returns being posted by the bank. What's your take? Is there something going on here that we're, you know, we're on the outside, on living on Main Street that we're missing? Oh, yes, very definitely. Basically, banking accounting has always been very, very difficult to understand. And it's become evident now to uh, many investors that it is so difficult to understand that perhaps it's not being totally truthful. One simple example is that when the banks buy a bond, a treasury bond, and put it in their portfolio, even though the value of that treasury bond may have gone down because interest rates went up, if the banks put it in a portfolio called held to maturity, they don't have to show the decline. So right away, you're sitting in a situation where, you know, the real equity of the bank is below the current equity of the bank, and that's very disturbing. You should be able to see that, but you can't, all right? Secondly, you know, we could go into the way they take a look at something called tangible common equity because they don't want to show that the return on equity is low. So, you know, basically what I think you're going to see over the next year, maybe two years, is a raft of regulations to clean up the way banks report their uh, earnings, the way they report the structure of their, their, their balance sheets. And that's not going to be pleasant for the banks because the banks are going to have to, in my view, raise more equity capital. It's going to uh, result in lower margins on their business and it's going to impact their earnings negatively. So before we get there, I just want to let everybody know that there was a couple of people who submitted questions ahead of time. We're going to try to get to those. But if you do have a question, please post this in the comments and uh, we will try to address them. If not, we'll get them to Dick and Matt and John afterwards and get those taken care of. Matt, I think in the same episode, you talked about, uh, let me just get my note here so I don't misquote it. You said the run on Silicon Valley Bank was a digital bank run, the likes of which we have never seen before which is why you say the regulators had to step in and stop it. So was this just a digital run? Are we at the tip of a bigger banking crisis? Is that crisis over? Or as Dick was talking about, are there other issues that need to be resolved? Well, I will leave the expertise on, on the other issues to Dick because there's no one better to comment on, on the banking issues. What I was referring to was the biggest FDIC rescue in history was Washington Mutual. And my recollection, I looked it up, was that the Friday before it was rescued by the FDIC, they had withdrawals of around $14 billion. And that was enough to strain their cash positions and, and put them into FDIC receivership. The, the interesting thing about Silicon Valley Bank was they had $42 billion. So it was three times the amount of the bank run. I don't believe Silicon Valley was anywhere close to the size of bank that Washington Mutual was at the time. And so $42 billion was a huge number. And then you had these stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, these anecdotal stories of CEOs on retreats in, in Montana on a coach bus, taking them from the airport to a resort. And someone took a picture of from the back of the bus and every single person, you know, it's all CEOs from Silicon Valley, was on the Silicon Valley app wiring out money. And it's just one of those classic things because once once this rumor spread and it got into, into the ether that Peter Thiel had instructed his you know, portfolio companies to withdraw their capital. And, and there were other instances of, of stories of people telling their portfolio companies to withdraw your capital. You had a bank run that was not sustainable. And you know, Dick, and, Dick is really good on this. And I don't mean to step into his turf at all because I, I don't nearly know as much about it. But the, the issue to me seemed to be that everyone woke up and saw these unrealized losses and 
either rightly interpreted them that you know the bank has no technical equity or wrongly interpreted them that there was this crisis because the thing about banking is it's a it's it, it to a degree it's a it's a degree of confidence that your bank will be stable if everyone uh, believes that your bank is not stable they're right because that belief that spreads causes the collapse no bank can, can survive a bank run of a significant magnitude where everyone is withdrawing their cash at any time. Silicon Valley just happened to be the one that taught us that. So I think there's some arguments to be made that, you know, just like we don't understand, you know, the, the technical details about plumbing when we flush the toilet, or we don't understand the technical details of how power stations work when we turn on the lights. You know, these are regulated industries, just like banking, where a lot of the normal people don't understand the piping. And to some degree, I think it hurts the public that it's so public that banks have you know, positions that the regulators, by rule, deem safe, but leads to these cat catastrophic outcomes. I wonder if we wouldn't be better served by regulators saying this bank is a healthy bank, it has our stamp of approval, and it has our insurance. And we don't really see the, the nitty-gritty details because the bank run is, in my mind, what caused the problem, not necessarily mismanagement, although mismanagement, whew, they could have done a lot better in communicating where they were and on that equity raise and on the liquidation of some of their held to maturity bonds. So Matt, with that, do you anticipate that there could be potentially more situations like this that could happen for banks that had a similar portfolio as SVB? Well, I think if you had, the FDIC did a few things. One of them was they allow, sorry, the Federal Reserve Bank allowed two banks to post collateral at their par amount. So if you have a treasury that matures in 2050 that traded down 30 points because of the duration risk as interest rates rose, under the old rules, you could only post that for collateral of up to 70 points. Now you can post it for par. If those rules had been in place during the Silicon Valley collapse, they wouldn't have run out of cash. So at a minimum, they would have been able to afford the bank run. So I, in my mind, it helps a lot. Now, Dick has talked a lot, and I think he's probably a better place to answer this on how their earnings are going to be really constrained going forward. And so the idea that this is the end, I think, is, is probably a little bit premature. Dick, it sounds like he teed it up for a question for you. So what can we expect going forward from with earnings coming out for the banks you know, right now? And, and I guess part of that, and, and this can go back to both of you just for, for an opinion, was the collapse of SVB overblown? Was it a reaction? You know, was it more reactionary or was it inevitable regardless that, you know, what happened over that, you know, few, two or three day period? Well, I mean, clearly SVB created the problem. The reason why it was so extreme is because money is no longer a physical, if you will, piece of paper or a physical mineral. Money is a, you know, an electronic signal which sits on a database. And therefore, if it was, we'll say, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and people wanted to take their money out of Silicon Valley Bank, they would have had to get in their car, drive to the bank, knock on the door, ask the manager, you know, for the money. And the manager would say, well, you know, we'll have it for you in a couple of days because it's sitting at the uh, San Francisco Fed and we just have to have them deliver it to us. You would go home very unhappy because you didn't get your money, but you probably wouldn't go back in a couple of days because you figured that the San Francisco Fed gave the money to Silicon Valley. So it was there. This time, since, you know, money was an electronic signal, all you had to do was pick up your cell phone. Or, you know, if you're a large corporation, you know, you know, talk to your IT guy and say, take X amount of dollars out, take $2 billion out. You could take $2 billion out in literally seconds. So you see, you know, the, the change in the nature of what money is contributed a lot to the fact that this was such an extreme uh, amount of money flowing out of that bag in such a short period. But what did the bank do wrong? What the bank did wrong was it trusted the United States government in the sense that uh, th this bank knew that it was in the risky loan business. And everybody who invested in this bank knows that their business is, is in high risk loans. OK, so what the bank would do is it, it would take the excess deposits that it would get in and put them into treasuries and make the assumption that the treasuries, you know, were safe because treasuries are in fact safe. What it didn't understand, and this is a terrible, it, it cost them their company, and, and it's totally their fault, that these treasuries can go down in value. 
and, and if the Federal Reserve is going to come along and, and raise interest rates, uh, let's say 400 basis points in a period of 12 months, the value of these treasuries are going to go down pretty rapidly. So they never hedged against their position in the uh, treasury market. They never considered the fact that they shouldn't have put in that much money into treasuries that, that had this variability in, in value, but they did it. And because they did it, and because interest rates went up rapidly, you know, the value of their equity, you know, fell dramatically. People got frightened, took their money out using their cell phones, and there's no more Silicon Valley Bank. But you should keep back in your back of your mind that the Federal Reserve itself is doing exactly what Silicon Valley Bank did. The Federal Reserve, because of these quantitative easing programs, has purchased, you know, some $8 trillion worth of securities since 2008. It doesn't have the money to buy those securities, even though people will say, well, yeah, the Federal Reserve can print money. No, they can't. They can only print a certain amount of money because they print too much money. They have to, you know, it will create a massive inflation. So what did the Federal Reserve do to buy this $8 trillion worth of you know, securities? They borrowed money in the short-term money market. They borrowed $2.7 trillion in the uh, reverse repo market, and they borrowed well over $4 trillion at one point from the banking industry. So what they were doing is borrowing money, which had you know, short-term interest rate costs, and they were investing it into fixed income securities which the yield could not change because, as I said, the, these coupons were set. So the net effect is the Federal Reserve itself is in a position where in the fourth quarter it lost $15.4 billion. And if you were to mark that entity's uh, balance sheet to market, you would see that the Federal Reserve has real net worth of negative $1 trillion. Now, for some reason, nobody cares about that, but they should care about it because it has huge effects on the money market, on the money supply, on private equities, of private entities' ability to get funds. It is it's disastrous. It also is a major factor in considering whether the Fed can ease monetary policy or not, or whether they could change interest rates or not. Because if the Fed is forced to keep borrowing money to support a part portfolio of securities, which is underwater, it is going to create serious problems in the way we operate the financial system of the United States. And Dick, it seems like that is also related to de-dollarization around the world with the dollar in some way. So maybe John, we'll start with you this time, but I'd love to hear from Dick and Matt as well on this. How concerned should we be with a lot of countries saying that they're moving away from the U.S. dollar? as reserve currency or using it for trade. Is that something that's really concerning for businesses? Is it concerning for the average everyday American? What, what does this look like for us moving forward if there's less reliance and confidence in the US dollar? Well, I'll let Dick and Matt um, kind of get into that in a little more depth than I'm gonna provide, but we've discussed this on Odeon Capital Conversations on a regular basis. We've been looking at that whole phenomena, especially with the geopolitical um, situation in the world and what's happening in Russia, China, and, you know, different allies, you know, separating and coming apart. I mean, I think something in the region of 60% of trade is done in US dollars today. But, you know, you see, you, you see all kinds of maneuvers. The BRIC countries, I think it was a year ago or so ago, were trying to come together to sort of challenge the US dollar. I don't know whether they would have the muscle to do that, but you know, combined, they're pretty, that's a pretty large trading block. Um, but it's, I think Dick's rationale and theory is that the dollar ultimately will be, just, will be crushed uh, by foreign adversaries. Yeah, well, if you want me to comment on that, uh, basically, it, 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 it is going to happen. You know, just, just take a look at the newspapers. People don't look at the newspapers, I guess, anymore. Look at the television over the last few uh, weeks. What, what has happened? You know, the, the premier of China went to Russia and he cut a number of deals in Russia. The premier of China set a, a detente, so to speak, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And there was no Western country, not the United States or anyone else involved. The, the premier of China is now hosting, you know, 
the, the fact that, you know, the president of France is there because the president of France wants China to do business with. You know, what you, you're seeing in these news reports is a reality, which is that there is a new sphere of influence in the world, which is, you know, if you will, dominated by China to a lesser degree by Russia. And that sphere of influence is building, its, has, has already built its own financial infrastructure. It has its own ecosystem. It has its own IMF. It has its own World Bank. It has its, its loaned trillions of dollars to, to 160 countries around the world. And there was just some news uh, yesterday that Russia now handles more transactions in the Chinese yuan than it does in dollars. So, so the net effect, it's, 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 it's definitely something that will happen. Is it bad for the United States? Yes, it's terrible for the United States. Why? Because if you have the world's reserve currency, everybody needs to have that currency to do business in the global, uh, if you will, financial markets. And to get that currency, you got to buy them from the United States or from the United States banks. And the, therefore, you, you got a certain cost, a currency cost, in translating, uh, you know, your currency into dollars so you can buy oil, which is being sold in do dollars. If, if there's another currency out there where you could do that, you know, notably the, the, the Chinese yuan, and they're doing that already, right? I mean, you know, the Chinese are demand, you know, buying, uh, you know, Russian oil for its yuan. They're demanding that Iran use yuan to, to, to buy, buy products from China. You know, then if they become the dominant producer of manufactured goods and natural resources, then we are going to have to buy yuan in order to buy products from them. And that's going to cost us something. The other thing is, if you have the world's reserve currency and you want to, uh, you know, have a $4 trillion deficit, which we had a couple of years back, you know, you, why worry? Everybody else in the world has to buy it because they have to support the dollar and they have to support, you know, whatever, whatever need we have for, for funds. I, I forgot the name of the Treasury Secretary uh, who was once asked, you know, do you ever worried, uh, are you ever worried about the fact that the foreigners have to buy this currency to, to support the U.S., uh, you know, deficit? And he said, why should I worry? They have to do it. Well, if there's another reserve currency in the world, they don't have to do it. And finally, you know, if we're going to start pricing uh, lithium, copper, you know, uh, you know, uh, rhodium, uh, you know, uh, uranium in, in yuan, then it's going to be highly inflationary for the United States. So, yes, you know, we are going to lose, you know, we, we've, we've blown it in terms of the way we've politicized the dollar. We, we have forced, I think we have 30 countries sanctioned who can't even use the dollar, right? And, and we, we've got hundreds of individuals sanctioned who can't even use the dollar. Well, what are they supposed to do? They have to find another currency, and they did. So the net effect is, you know, as a result of our punitive political actions with using the currency as a weapon and the desire of the Chinese and the Russians to supplant the dollar, the dollar will be supplanted. I mean, we'll still have our sphere of influence in which the dollar is king, and this won't happen, you know, next year or the year after that, but it, it is happening. It will, five years from now, in my view, the dollar will be one of two dominant reserve currencies in the world. That will be inflationary for the United States. It'll affect our ability to borrow money at the federal level. It'll affect, uh, you know, a series of uh, other, you know, interplays that occur between nations because we can no longer say to Iran, you know, you don't do it the way we want. Well, baby, you ain't getting a buck. You're not going to be able to operate in the, in, in the global financial system. You're out. Okay. We can't do, we won't be able to do things like that. So it, it, it is a changing world and we're going to have to adjust to it. And we are not making the right adjustments. And with that, Dick and, and Matt, I'd love to hear from you on this. You mentioned, you know, sometimes our uh, issues with technology, with the speed of which people can, you know, withdraw or, or do things with money. Is there a way where doing a gold standard or doing something with Bitcoin may help the confidence level? of the US dollar again. Are there any things that we can do to try and get back some of what we're starting to lose? Well, th these are tough conversations because the reality is, is we're making predictions based on trend lines we assume will continue or we make assumptions about how these trend lines will change. 
there's a lot of things the United States could change between now and the disastrous decoupling of the reserve currency from the rest of the world that would stop it from happening. As of now, we're not doing those things, but it doesn't mean it's inevitable that it will happen. You know, you, you ask about Bitcoin and gold. The, the quote that Dick just gave or summarized with John Connolly, he was the Secretary of Treasury under President Nixon. It was, it's our currency, but it's your problem. And he was saying that in 1971, and in some ways he was foreshadowing the decoupling of the dollar from gold, because that happened right around that time. And it was the solution to this this massive gold problem that we had, where the United States was running out of gold because we were supporting our currency backed by gold and other federal other federal reserve banks, I believe it was France or some other European bank was basically calling our bluff and saying, we want our gold. And you know, right. Nixon had to do something to stop it. And so we, we left that. The idea that Bitcoin could be the solution, I think has been proven ridiculous. I don't think Bitcoin is the solution. And I also think that as much as it's interesting that the Yuan is taking play, is, is transferring as a, a mechanism of trade between countries that are not welcome in the dollar world is a byproduct of the the pipes that exist, not necessarily a byproduct of sanctions. You know, we, we, we've had sanctions on Iran for pushing 40 or 50 years. We've had sanctions on Cuba for longer. And both of those countries are roughly dollar-based con- economies. Um, the dollar is king in both countries. And the idea that the yuan is taking place, is, is displacing the United States currency as a reserve currency, to me, it's belied by the fact that the yuan is basically pegged to the U.S. dollar. And not only that, but there's other currencies that are in the Chinese realm. I'm, I'm looking at you, the Hong Kong dollar, which has been strictly pegged for decades. And every now and then you have you know hedge funds that come out with their best ideas for the year. And the idea is to short the Hong Kong dollar because you know they're not going to let the peg. They're, they're not going to be able to maintain the peg. And year after year, they maintain the peg. Same with the yuan. So the idea that we're just displacing the dollar to switch pipes from U.S. dollar pipes to yuan pipes, we're still pegged to the U.S. dollar. Prices are still done in U.S. dollars. You know, they do have an IMF. They do have their own BRICS infrastructures, but they're not, they're not sizable. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like we're, we're looking at these alternatives to the U.S. dollar and making predictions about which one's going to win. But what you're really talking about is you're looking at these little infants in cribs and they can still be, you know, choked out by any means before they get to the big gorilla size that's the U.S. dollar. And so while I agree the U.S. dollar does look unstable, it does look like it's in its least confident position as a reserve currency in decades, it's really hard for me to sit and agree that we know how it's going to end and which currency is going to replace it. Because until you have a consensus of a majority of the world switching to something else and then actually implementing that and then relying on it and then determining it's better and not rushing back to the dollar which right now everyone can do because the yuan's pegged, you're not really in this experimental land that is out there. What you're really doing is we've cut off the pipes, they found new pipes in a different currency, and everything's going fine. And countries that haven't had access to the dollar for decades, they're still pretty good too. I mean, Iran is not some, you know, it's backwater compared to other places over in that region, but it's not like it was was turned into the Stone Age. And Russia's economy has been just stunning since they invaded Ukraine. Their currency for a long time... If you, if you measure it from the day after they invaded, after that original collapse, it's been one of the strongest performing currencies in the world. I believe it's kind of on parity to where it was pre, pre-invasion pre of Ukraine. So the sanctions haven't worked, but I don't think that it's necessarily leading to the de, de, dethroning of the dollar. I want, I want to make sure we have, that we also address some of the other issues. So I know we can spend a lot more time on, on SVV Bank and a few people commented on that. And, and then also the uh, de-dollarization, I guess trend. But I, w- I want to talk about some of the kind of, I guess, the table, the, the table topics, the kitchen table topics that we that we're dealing with, uh, that many of our listeners are. So I know in the in the past couple of shows, we talked about a recession coming or here, or it's not going to come or it's going to be a soft landing. So I want to get an update on that. But just I think it was just this week, if not, it was in the last few days, the Cleveland Fed chair said that she sees interest rates, the Fed interest rate topping Five percent. The question is: Is what impact? I have two part question. What impact do you see that having? Are there certain interesting that'll be, industries that'll be affected? And you you talked about decou- We talked about decoupling on a few things. 
is should the unemployment rate be decoupled from some of this conversation? Because it seems that we're still pushing to have a higher interest rate, which will slow the economy, which will naturally raise the demand because it will increase unemployment. But that doesn't seem to be working yet. And there seems to be a school of thought that that forcing raising the rates high enough so we have higher unemployment is the is in today's world the wrong direction. So I know there's a lot there. So I, Matt, I'm gonna I'm, you're smiling. I'm gonna throw it to you, <laughs> and then we'll go to Dick, and then I, I want to bring in John because we also want to talk about we, we want to close out today's segment with where we're going with AI. Yeah, I mean, look the. the... There's a famous quote amongst economists that they predicted 10 of the last three recessions. And I think we're not immune from that ourselves because you look at the data and it sure looks like we're heading straight into a brick wall. And, you know, the biggest, biggest tell and the, the consistent, most consistent predictor of recessions is the inverted yield spread between the two year and the 10 year. And that's basically telling you that people are just giving up on on short-term gains and are just flying to safety because they want to be in, in a, a duration asset like the 10-year bond that is going to provide some yield because it's just a place to hide out in the storm during the recession. And that spread, I believe, hit its widest point this week. And it's been inverted for a while and it usually is a very strong indicator. And then you throw on top of it, we have a Congress and a Senate and a president who seem all, all really deeply held positions that they shouldn't raise the debt ceiling or they should raise the debt ceiling without negotiation but those seem to be the two perfectly held positions. And if you have a debt crisis in the United States, that could be a problem. Throw on the war in Ukraine, throw on the high interest rates, throw on the high inflation. There's just a lot of headwinds that seem impossible to overcome. And you have to overcome all of them and you have to have score a perfect landing on this economy. It, it just seems really tough right now. And I, I think I, I share the view, but I hate predicting recessions because every time I've done it, I've been wrong. But it just sure seems like we're going to have one later this year. Dick? Yeah, well, from my point of view, you know, I've been wrong in saying that we, we're going to have a recession now for about 18 months, okay? So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd like to be consistent in being wrong because uh, obviously we're not in a recession right now. But uh, if you think money is important for anything, right, uh, let's assume you're running a business and, all, uh, and you've been getting, uh, you know, your inventory has been funded by uh, money which is freely available and, and is at, uh, it, it, you know, relatively low cost, uh, maybe record low uh, costs, right? And now you, you, you're still running that business, you, you're, you're very happy, but, you know, money is not freely available because the banking system has got to deal with issues because the Federal Reserve has got to deal with issues. So money is less available, number one. Number two, when you get that money, you got to pay more for it. So therefore, someone has got to pick up that cost of money from you. Otherwise, you're not going to you're not going to be able to sell, uh, keep your company running. And that means that you have to assume that the consumers have to have more money to buy the products which you're selling. Well, what, how does the consumer get the money? The consumer is, uh, you know, supposedly as a result of inflation, uh, Jamie Dimon in this famous letter that he writes every uh, year, he said that by the end of this year, all of the excess funding that the consumer had through the pandemic will be gone, all right? And, and he, he, the consumer's buying power has come down dramatically. So now, what do you do? You know, if, if you're a business, you got to sell the product at a higher price or you're not going to make a profit. If you're a consumer, you can't keep affording to buy all these products because you have less disposable personal income on, a, on a, an inflation adjusted basis to buy these products. So you would have to assume that you are going to have a recession. As they say, I've been assuming that and it just hadn't happened. But the point is, you know, I don't see at this point why it won't happen. And, and if I throw on, you know, this uh, gobbledygook I mentioned about the Federal Reserve, how does the Federal Reserve get out of its problem? How does it stop losing money? How does it all of a sudden get real net worth so it's in a position where it can print money again whenever it wants? Well, the only way it's going to happen is if it, if it, if it drives a recession. And therefore, I do not think the Federal Reserve is going to back off. I do think inflation has reduced demand throughout the economy. I do think that if you're going to make money less available at higher prices, 
it is going to ultimately result in an adjustment throughout the whole system. And of course, that's what the Fed thinks. That's what economists think. That's what, you know, a whole bunch of people think. But the point is, it hasn't happened, right? It just hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened? Because the amount of money that was created over the last couple of years is beyond belief. I mean, if you take a look at the uh, year over year increase in the money supply two years ago, it was 26%. We've been creating trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And that's not an understatement. And we've been, you know, obviously you magnify every dollar that's, uh, that's created by, you know, utilizing it within the economy. So, you know, that money has not dried up yet. You know, people still have their jobs, their incomes, you know, are still rising. But the money has not dried up. And until that money dries up, you know, I guess the recession will be put further and further off. But I don't see really how it can be put off beyond the end of 2023. And Dick, with well, that, I mean, noting, oh, um, go ahead, John. Yeah, no, it's just worth noting that the conditions do seem to be tightening. The The World Bank, by the way, just came out with a report saying that expecting slower growth globally over the next couple of years. But um, ADP just announced, you know, employment numbers, uh, 145,000 jobs in March was below the 200. 200,000, which was the consensus forecast, and the um, JOLTS report showed a drop in job openings uh, by 632,000 to uh, just under 10 million. That's below the uh, February number. So, so there's tightening conditions. And, you know, anecdotally, which anecdotes aren't good, you know, barometers, but they do tell us something and you can make your own judgments ultimately. But retailers, the big CEOs are saying that they're noticing at the stores throughout America that shoppers are, are very, you know, they've tightened their, their purses and their, their spending patterns suggest that we're headed towards uh, more, you know, recessionary kind of conditions. And with that, John, some of the data that came out this week for the typical American in terms of debt, really some alarming numbers that are coming out. We are now at record high level total household debt of $16.5 trillion, record high debt on auto loans of $1.6 trillion, record credit card debt of $986 billion. And then, oh, by the way, the student loans are going to be kicking back in again, which are currently sitting at a record $1.6 trillion. So it definitely feels like for a lot of Americans that have kind of been putting things off to the side and making it through, that there is going to come that point in time this year where the tightening of the belts is already starting to happen and the reality is starting to set in of how many of them are going to struggle with paying off a lot of these debts that are out there. Hey, Jason, you're exactly yeah, correct. Absolutely. It'd be, Jason, if you take yeah, a look just at in, in a high interest rate environment, that consumer debt becomes even a bigger challenge. If you take a look at the growth rate of uh, you know credit card loans, which is running around 15% year over year right now, incomes are not growing at 15% year over year. If you take a look at you know the growth rate in overall debt, you know it's it's some, something like nine and a quarter percent, and and incomes are growing. Uh, just personal disposable income are growing about four percent. You know so so basically incomes are growing at half the rate of the debt, and that debt as John just clearly indicated is going to cost more and more because interest rates are much higher than when the debt was put in place. The consumer is not going to be the driver that gets us out of whatever the economic mess we get into is. It's got to be business. I mean, business has got to do it. And they, 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 in my view, they definitely will do it through natural resource production, through increased manufacturing activity, through more food production, and through more defense uh, product production. So I think there's a way out of this thing, which will be very, very positive, but it, it just isn't going to be driven by the consumer. I also think, Jason, you, you left the big elephant out of the room, which is the national debt, the growing national debt at a growing rate. I mean, the president's budget, you know, ignoring the, the debt limit debate, but the budget itself was calling for almost $3 trillion of deficit spending this year. Like $3 trillion is just yeah. a mind-boggling amount of money, but... Ignoring that, you still have Social Security and Medicare, which, you know, Dick talks a lot about accurate accounting for the Fed, which, you know, everyone would wake up and wet the bed if they, if they knew how bad the situation was at the Fed. If you knew how bad the situation was at the Social Security Administration, you would do a lot worse things because 
you know, th there's ways that insurance companies and pension companies have to calculate their long-term obligations to pensioners based on their assets and based on their revenue and do a mark-to-market -mark the same way the Fed would do if it were a normal entity. And if Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid were held, you know, I've seen the best estimate I've seen is about $180 trillion of, of unfunded deficit. But I've seen other ones that are closer to two and three hundred trillion. Either way, it's not you know half a trillion there, half a trillion here. It's it's a real number. And once you get into hundreds of trillions, now you're talking a real problem. Throw on top of it everything you guys just mentioned. The personal household budgets are just completely growing wildly out of balance relative to income. Just as America is doing the exact same thing, it's really hard to see how the Fed can be the the savior here if we end up in a bad recession. I think it's worth adding also, um, we've spoken about this famous doom loop in the past, and I think servicing of the national debt or debt servicing is like 650 billion per annum and rising because of higher interest rates. Yeah, well, the, the expression that I like to use is that we are our grandchildren. In other words, every politician has always said, well, you're kicking the can down the, can down the road. You know, what is your grandchildren going to do when it, when it hits them? We are our grandchildren. It hit, it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us, you know, in, in, it's hitting us now and it's going to become far more pronounced in, in my view as the year goes on. I want to switch gears here just a, a, a little bit and get into some of the things that we talk about on a, on a kind of a weekly basis and some of the things that are, that are, uh, yeah, that are a concern. And one is commercial real estate. And we're still in this debate. I know a lot of the companies have pulled remote workers back and, you know, some people feel that there's, there's a shift in there and that companies now have that control. But just about a month ago, we had, we hosted a panel, it was about remote work. And Kate Lister, who's founder and CEO of a Global Workplace Analytics, she made an intriguing point that although we're in this controversy about remote hybrid work where people should work, it only makes up about 40% of the, of the workforce anyway, or less. But she felt that the real, and, and the other panelists did too, Jeff Abbott, who's from Avanti, uh, CEO of Avanti, said that the real impact of companies shedding corporate space won't be felt until the next few years when the leases start to expire. So if we're looking ahead to like 2030 and, and at the end of those leases, everybody contracts the space that they're doing, are we in for what I guess we've experienced the last 10 or 15 years with shopping malls? And what impact does that have? Or does that create an opportunity for kind of a reutilization, a regentrification of space into residential. Well, the, if you walk around uh, Wall Street uh, today, or you walk around Wall Street back when I started in the business uh, over 50 years ago, what you would see is that uh, it, 50 years ago, all that area was, you know, businesses. There were, all those buildings were filled with uh, companies that were, were, were mainly financially oriented, but they were producing things. And there was, you know, you you wouldn't you wouldn't see any, uh, you know, residential activity anywhere in that area. But if you walk around there today, you can see women, you know, with baby carriages taking their children out for a stroll down Wall Street and in uh, you know across Broadway, etc because those buildings that were used for, if you will, business purposes, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, are now being converted to residences. And I'm convinced that uh, if there is a housing shortage in the United States, and I believe that there is, and if there is, you know, uh, an inability to produce a lot of housing product because of zoning and other, uh, you know, financial and government and all these other issues, you know, converting to co-ops and condominiums, you know, which, you know, it occurs in, in spits and stops, I think that'll start again. And I think this office space is all going to be uh, somebody's, uh, you know, you know, nursery at some point. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be switched to residential. But anyway, the point is, you know, you can't scratch, I think, an analyst who won't say that when the leases come due, you know, doom is there or won't say that office buildings are empty and are going to stay empty. But the fact is, we're not seeing that show up in, you know, loan losses in, in the banking industry at all. It, it, it's just not there. It's not happening. Uh, and I have a feeling that uh, real estate entrepreneurs are very bright, very flexible, very sharp people. 
and they will find a way to use those buildings. You know, you're not going to turn, you know, downtown of most cities in the United States into Gary, Indiana. You know, it's it's going to be. That, I think that space will be utilized, and I don't I don't see a collapse in the in the uh, non-residential real estate market in this country. Matt, do you tend to agree? Yeah, I think I think I think people are have learned the long wrong lesson from 2008, where you had a fast-moving real estate collapse. But that was a different scenario. Dick's right. You have professionals running commercial real estate. You know, I, I use our example. We signed a long-term lease in a tier A1 building in, in New York or class A building in New York um, in November of 2019. I think if we had waited till April of 2020, we might have gone leaseless. But instead, we're here for another 15 years. And I hope we're here for another 15 years because that means we're, we're, you know, cruising along. So they don't have a problem with us. And by and large, if I were running a building, I would have my turnover. I would try to target turnover on you know, on an average of, you know, 10 to 12% per year. And so it's a slower moving crisis. And, you know, Dick's right. The, the idea that these professionals don't see this coming and don't have time to prepare, you know, when slow moving crisis, what happens is, especially in a real estate problem, and, and you see it in the residential in Manhattan where, you know, last year Manhattan gained residents while every other borough lost. It's not because Manhattan suddenly got cheaper. It's because the people who are spending, you know, $3,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn realized they could move to Manhattan and spend $3,000 a month and get a one-bedroom. And so they'd rather move. And so they move to Manhattan. And what happens is the higher quality places are still going to have demand and still going to have, you know, tenants that want. And, and the people on the periphery, on the on the slightly less desirable, right on the on the cuff, We'll, we'll have time to transition. So I agree with Dick that this is not going to be, you know, I, I see on Twitter people talking about the commercial real estate collapse of 2008 redux. And this is like, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I agree with Dick. When, and we're approaching toward the end. We got a few minutes here, but we, we definitely want to bring in John as we started. And we talked about the other hot topic, not this week, but for the last few months has been AI. And it sort of went mainstream with ChatGPT but now artificial intelligence, a big report came out of Stanford yesterday, uh, which I know I, I shared with John, John shared with me almost simultaneously. And I guess this is on a good news that there's 800,000 job openings that require AI skills. So as we've talked about before, as some jobs get ex go, grow extinct or, or get de-skilled, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of new jobs that are developing. But with that, John, you had this fascinating interview with Mark Seal just a few weeks ago, who's, um, who has the, he's the CEO of Sortium. And he shared his take on, on AI, on, on the direction where AI is going, some of the opportunities there. So, and, and obviously that, you know, that's up for debate, but uh, everybody suspects that it will impact the way we work, live and do, and it's going to be uh, one of the most disruptive trends that we've experienced in uh, and maybe since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, although given that the Industrial Revolution took about 100 years to unravel and with uh, the way things are going now, it could be in the next, within the next few years or less than a decade. So, John, can yeah, you no, he, your, yeah, that was his that. point. I mean, other commentators have made the same point that AI is going to accelerate the pace of how we do our jobs today. We won't recognize if we were fast forward 10 years, we won't recognize in his words what we're doing now. It's going to be an extraordinary, incredible development. Some people are calling now for a pause on how AI is rolled out. I mean, we don't want to be anti-technology or Luddites, but because there are a lot of huge productivity benefits from AI, which we should welcome. You know, I mean, the mind boggles. We could have another, you know, green revolution like we had in India several generations ago, because it's probably going to improve how we handle all our agricultural processes and industrial processes. But the, the interesting thing about Mark is that he's, he's from New York, he's a young guy, and he moved down to El Salvador, which was to me was fascinating. But uh, part of that was because uh, the, some of the team leaders, at least one of them has family there. And so they set up and he said, it's fantastic. You know, the government is very welcoming. And, you know, Mark has worked with a lot of brands, including Disney and the Topps Company and into gaming and so on. But the two questions I asked him was, does El Salvador have some kind of a business hub, hubs, you know, throughout the country to encourage, you know, 
inward investment and businesses. And he said, not, not that I'm aware of, you know, but, you know, I don't know whether that was interesting that he brought it up because just in the past week, if you've been following the business press, El Salvador has removed all taxes related to tech innovation for economic growth. And in its plan that was released by the president there, they're going to create these industrial hubs or business hubs, you know, throughout the city and so on. Now, it's a small example. It's a small country. It has a lot of economic problems and, you know, was very quick there to back the, bit, you know, to make Bitcoin, Bitcoin legal tender. And I will stick with that, you know. I mean, some of that, of course, was, I guess, anti-Americanism or whatever. But a fascinating guy, um, for sure. So what we'd like to do is, before we wrap up here, and again, I'm sure we can go on and on for, for, for a long time with you guys. And again, as always, we hope we have you back. But we like to uh, close out our segments with our, our fa- one of our favorite questions is, what should we have asked that we didn't? So, Dick, let me, let me start with you. What should we have asked you or, or the team that we didn't? Well, we touched upon it a little bit, but I think this creation of spheres of influence around the world or a return to the world pre-World War I, I think is extraordinarily, import, extraordinarily important because basically it is going to change the way business is done in the United States. And I use Apple as a simple example. Apple you know, designs these wonderful telephones. It then sends the designs to, to China or other places in Southeast Asia, and they're built there. And then that's sent back to the United States so that American consumers can borrow money to buy those telephones or, or whatever they call it right now. So anyway, the, the bottom line is that's done. In other words, w- American business can no longer simply design and require some other uh, low labor cost nation to build the products. We have got to build the products here. And I think that that is going to be the salvation of our economy because I said the consumer is finished. But anyway, the point is, I think that uh, that's, a, that's a subject which, you know, we, we, we haven't touched on really at all, which I think really is where the best investment opportunities lie, where the United States is going to be going. Uh, and I just wish we'd get there faster than we are today. <laughs> okay. Matt? I think the, the biggest thing I would have touched on is what can the average person do? What, what are we supposed to do when we talk about, you know, these are kind of awkward conversations. We're talking about how the debt on household balance sheets, the debt of the United States, the debt is piling up in a way that, you know, it, it seems like we're collectively making a decision to stick our head in the sand and just pretend it's not our problem. And I think... You know, if, if you're out there running up credit card debt, what you should do right now is go and figure out, you know, watch a Susie Orm show, figure out how to get your household balance sheet under control, get your spending under control, and find a way out of debt. Because the best way to survive an economic crisis is to be economically prepared. And if we're going to have economic crises going forward, acting like there's no tomorrow and spending like, uh, what's the phrase, a drunken sailor is not the way to get ready for this economic crisis if there's one coming. The way to be prepared, the way to be self-resilient is to have a budget, to operate and live within a budget. And if every household did that, maybe, just maybe, we might care that our political leaders are doing the opposite with our country, and we might start voting for people that care about uh, running a, an economically sound balance sheet as a country and as a, as a state and, and as cities and try to get this American dream back to where it was you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago where anyone could do back of the envelope math and be like, okay, we're okay. Because right now it's starting to look dire and it looks like it's about to get a lot worse. And I think people should get their own balance sheets in order and get their own households in order as a way to inoculate their own families from from the the risk of financial instability. Absolutely. Absolutely. John, it sounds like you got a couple of conversations teed up for Odeon Capital Conversations. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with Dick and Matt there. And then maybe we could have added to that. Uh, we could maybe delve into AI. Can it save us from ourselves uh, in terms of, you know, the demographic disaster we have in the globe, shortage of workers? I and mean, we're seeing that already, that Walmart announced that it's going to invest heavily in AI. That's going to be a lot more automated process, processes in the warehouses. Uh, Wall Street's also doing that. And there's some some good to that there's some bad to that and you know how will it all net out should we have a pause in ai some people are suggesting that but i think that's 
a question of ethics and not of impeding the you know progress of technology and all the good things it can do. And with that, a Goldman Sachs report also on AI that just came out last week was saying 300 million jobs is what they're looking at being disrupted by AI. And so I just got curious. I was like, what are some of the jobs out there around AI? There were positions called chat GPT, prompt engineers, and the position starting pay is around $150,000 to $200,000 a year. So guys, if things go sideways, I think all of us just need to learn how to put prompts in the chat GPT <laughs> and make $200,000 a year. It looks like that's the, the upskilling that's coming our way for a lot of industries. Yeah, I, I think that toothpaste is already out of the tube for that pay is because I, I think at least 10, 12 times a day, I got a, an offer for an ebook on, you know, here's 100 prompts, 150 prompts, 1,000 prompts for chat GPT. So I, I think that's there. But that reminds me of probably 15 years ago when we talked about, you know, kids playing games. And it's like, listen, what, when Ohio State and a couple other schools developed master's programs, in gaming and they were graduating they couldn't graduate enough people at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars starting salaries to work with tech companies gaming was probably a good a pretty good thing right was everybody sitting in their basements playing games developed a good career but we want to thank you we always have fascinating conversations with you and again the invitation is always open to come back a lot of topics that we didn't catch up on and just like 10 weeks ago it was ten. It was only ten weeks. Only ten weeks since we, we you were on here last. And look what's changed. So uh, hopefully we can get you back eight or ten weeks now, maybe in June, and and who knows what'll happen by then. But really appreciate it, Dick, Matt, John. Thanks so much Thank for being part of this, taking your time out of your busy days, and uh, joining Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Awesome episode, Ira. We want to thank everybody out there for tuning in today. And we just scratched the surface, as you heard, the number of things that have changed just over the last 10 months. You heard a lot of optimism, you know, things around AI and how it's going to make our lives better and how it can help us, you know, economically, but also a lot of things that are kind of dire in terms of the debt, de-dollarization, things that we really need our leadership to step up on. But first and foremost, we, we hope that this was really helpful for you in terms of understanding what small part maybe you can play in helping to, to get things turned around and get us back headed in the direction that we need to go. Just want to thank you for tuning in again. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, please do so on your favorite podcast platform, whether it be YouTube, Spotify, Apple, love for you to join us each week. But until next week, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Special thanks again to Dick Beauvais, Matt Van Alstein, and John Aiden Byrne for spending some time with us. Make sure you check out the top rated podcast. Odeon Capital Conversations. We've, for those that are that are, are watching, you can see the name up there. But if you're not, Odeon is O D E O N Capital Conversations. And also check uh, John's Dig Life Deep and my Future Shock 2.0 segment. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans. Hey.